I think it was uh, one of the things that we were discussing in the session just now, mm -hmm. which is that we're used to thinking of public opinion being shaped by traditional linear me media. And in that sense, public opinion is the product of a mass-mediated mm -hmm. process, and it produces the, the opinion as a mass, as in a sense, what's the consensus, what's the majority? Those are the appropriate questions uh, when you're thinking of public opinion in that way. And, you know, political science is very much based upon that idea mm -hmm. that what you can do is sort of make some sort of, get some understanding of how, what people's political affiliations are, how they might vote and so on and so forth, as members of different groups within the uh, political landscape. And I think that idea of public opinion and polit public opinion formation are both sort of uh, being challenged by uh, di the digital media environment. So one thing is that there's the, 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 that assumes a notion that you can really think about politics mainly in terms of consensus. Mm -hmm. Our pur the purpose of politics, in a sense, is to reach consensus. And in a sense, to do that, you, you try and set aside your differences. You try and mm -hmm. set aside your, your own values, your own interests, and so on and so forth, and come to some sort of common articulation of the public will. And it's, that's a very traditional sort of mm -hmm. notion within uh, uh, liberal democracy. And what we, what we appear to, to be in the, the situation of now is that people aren't thinking of themselves as political subjects in that way. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they're not oriented towards, oh, what, what is it that I can sign up to at that level? It's more that they're, that they're individuals who can make a choice and take different positions on a range of different views and that, they can, and that, and that can be ephemeral. I mean, a good example from our recent experience of Brexit was the way in which there was very strong public uh, support for UKIP uh, in the run-up to the uh, 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 Brexit referendum and how by the time of the next uh, general election, which was only 18 months later, uh, that support had almost disappeared. It, it mm -hmm. dropped radically. It dropped radically. Now that's fascinating because it, it turned out to be uh, just as many Labour voters as Conservative voters, both the political right and the political left, had been for a certain period signing up to a particular agenda rather than, as it were, voting from their traditional <laughs> political affiliations. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just a, a, a nice example about, about an increased fluidity of public opinion and how it's not oriented towards traditional political allegiances and trying to form a consensus in that way, but will follow the issues and follow the trends as, as, as they emerge. And obviously digital media contributes to that sort of notion because it gives us a sense that we are, our, our relationship to the world of knowledge and information is in a sense through our own portal, through our own laptop, through our own mobile phone. It's, it's us connecting to directly to a world of knowledge and so on. And that gives us a sense of political subjectivity that's mm. very different to the traditional one, where it's about what is your affiliation to a particular political grouping. So I think those, are, those, those have been really significant changes so that, that, that it's difficult to, to know how to, whether the sort of concept of the sort of public will that sits behind our traditional ideas mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is now the right way of thinking about uh, public engagement with politics or whether we're talking about a period where there's going to be much more fluidity, instability and that it's more like a sort of, it's not so much an aggregate that creates a sort of public force as it were but it's more about who's engaging with and signing up to which uh, ideas uh, issues and so on and so forth that shapes the the public landscape yes that's right i think that the 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 i i think traditionally the notion of the public sphere was very much and it, it and this is very linked also to the notion of the role of journalism as a kind of mediator between the world of politics and everyday life everyday life is messy everyday life is lots of people with lots of different opinions and ideas going in all different directions, changing their mind, arguing with each other, furious with each other, and all, all, all of those things. That, that's everyday life. And in a sense, we've been through a period where there's been a kind of separation of those two things, a buffering of the political system from the direct effects of that sort of maelstrom of ideas and the mixture of contestation and disagreement and, and, and that notion of, of, of debate. And there's always been this idea that, that, that in a way, 
that both the public sphere and journalism played a similar sort of role, that they were a buffer between the political system and, 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 and everyday life. So I, if ideas are to be understood and taken on by the political system, they needed translating. They needed to be put in the terms that were understandable in terms of the political system. Journalism does that role partly. It goes out, it finds out what people are thinking, it articulates their concerns, uh -huh. And that's the interesting thing, that's the translation of this sort of rather fluid maelstrom of different views and different viewpoints, very different values, different understandings of what, what, politi what the political is, what political constitutes, and yet translated into terms that are understandable in ter for the political system. And then the other way, coming the other way, you need that buffer in a sense because you need the sort of jargon and terms and, and, and ways of thinking of the political system to be translated to the public. Mm -hmm. Journalism, in a sense, in its you know, finest forms, does both of these things. And it's, sort of, and, and it's, it, it, it's, it, it's like a professionalised version of a public sphere in that mm -hmm. sense. It creates... But uh, uh, I suppose uh, one critique, one criticism of that would be the standard criticism from uh, Habermas, uh, mm -hmm. w which is that this is this professionalization is a problem. Mm -hmm. That it was always a problem because it it meant there were so some particular points of view would be represented more than others. Mm -hmm. That you were too readily translating uh, differences of value and belief into the terms of the political system. Mm -hmm. Politics being primarily about equality and freedom, whereas we in our everyday lives have many, many different sort of interests and values that are in play. And it's about making that sort of connection between the two. Now what's happened with the uh, uh, digital media is that, that is, it's a form of communication that crosses those boundaries. Mm -hmm. So the public, the public realm, in a sense, is, going on, is undergoing an, a fascinating mm -hmm. transformation. We don't have those sort of constraints, those sorts of buffers, those sorts of translation processes in place anymore. They're all sort of interconnected. And when you get the President of the United States tweeting the population, that's a pretty good example mm -hmm. of a very direct form of communication between uh, politics and, 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 uh, and everyday life. And the, and the real concern was then, then that you lose that process, that buffering, you, you know, so you've got direct contact between uh, established power commercial or, or state power and the public and you haven't got the buffering there and then you've got it the other way you've got the, the this I've described it as this maelstrom of conflict and values which is everyday life which is the different ways that different forms of life that people hold and, 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 and live that inhabits the political system and this is classic concern that Habermas had when he formulated the public sphere theory that without some sort of buffer that each would sort of pollute the other. Mm -hmm. Power would be insinuated into the uh, far reaches of everyday life. Nothing we could do would not be touched by power. Mm -hmm. we are, you know, so we as, uh, as citizens are, are subject to power in a, in a much more naked way, and the, 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 clearly that's going on. But also power itself would be <laughs> polluted, he used the term of pollution, would be polluted by its exposure mm -hmm. to the vernacular, to the everyday. I think what it's bringing our attention to is that we have to be very careful about what we mean by democracy. Uh -huh. So, and I think a lot of people are writing and thinking very interesting things about this now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for the first point is that we, we've tended to take a model which is a sort of Anglo-American model, essentially, with elements of European mm -hmm. uh, democratic socialism, but predominantly an Anglo-American model of liberal uh, mm -hmm. democracy and uh, uh, literally apply it to other areas of the world in the sort of post-Soviet states, for example, but also as an idea of, of, of it being... David Held writes about the sort of... After 89, there was such hubris in Britain and America that there was nothing else standing, that the only way forward for the world was their particular understanding of mar uh, um, market liberalism. Uh, uh, and capitalism, and that this, this, this some, ver some version of that was the only uh, possibility that, that we could go forward. And so that model was sort of like imposed upon a, a, a range of countries who subsequently st struggled with, with, with that, particularly in Eastern Europe. And now the, the rise of the right is, is, is linked to that, to, to, that, to that process. So firstly, we, that's, that's, that's the idea of, of, of trying to entertain a more varied understanding of what democracy is. Because you have to have an understanding of what your democracy is before you answer the question, can uh, social theory help democracy? 
So you could take an extreme example, for, exa for example, where there's some very interesting examples in, in China where there's been an opening up and, and, and the possibility. I mean, we're, we're talking about a, 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 a single party state still with vestiges of uh, uh, state socialism, uh, uh, controlling markets and uh, still uh, pressing down hard on dissidents. That's, that's, mm -hmm. that's the state, state we have. Nevertheless, you can see that they, the, gov the Chinese government itself using or creating the opportunities for certain sorts of public discussion about serious social, political, economic issues through social media. Mm -hmm. It clamps down when it chooses, but, it, but there is still a lot of uh, discussion, fluidity, expressions of concern and, 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 and so on. So if we talk about deliberation, mm -hmm. deliberation isn't a political system, deliberation is a process within a political system. We can even see a, a, a particular version of a notion of deliberation uh, playing out there in such a, a, a very, mm -hmm. you know, non-liberal democratic uh, context. So deliberation is a, is a very interesting idea because it can be attached to any form of democratic governance. And uh, you could argue that there's always some advantage to opening up the possibilities for people to have a voice on a public issue and, uh, and, and, and for those in, a power to, in, in power to be exposed to the different opinions and voices that, that, are, that, are, that are out there on a, on a particular issue. So that's deliberation, as it were, as it feeds into government. And e-governance and all those other sorts of arguments uh, in, indicate to us that there are sort of very interesting ways in which uh, digital and social media can inform the process of, of government and put it put, put them in touch with currents of opinion, views, people, and 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 dissension and and, and and different ideas and so on and so forth. So that notion of deliberation is is is, is enhanced arguably, whatever the particular shell, whatever the particular form of dem democratic governance you had, there's certain advantages to, to, to governments engaging those sorts of processes. But getting back to Habermas's notion of deliberation, he, he has a dual notion of deliberation. And it's not just about the ca capabilities of governments, as it were, to give space for the public to have a say in particular political initiatives or, or, or developments. But it's also about as a, a notion of uh, civil society itself being sort of having some qualities that reflect the idea that it's possible for people to have across the very great differences in the way that they, uh, what they value and the, and the forms of life that they live, to f nevertheless find some form of engagement with each other. And so for Habermas, it's that there's that duality is very important. It's no good having a, 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 a in a well. There are problems associated with being a government that's deliberating mm -hmm. if you've not got a free flow of uh, engagement and ideas within the people themselves. So, so it, deliberation has this uh, duality. And one of the, one of the dangers about, uh, one, and, and concerns many people have expressed, is that uh, uh, you know, the internet is not, a, it, it's techno technology is neutral. But the way in which uh, the internet is now financed and, and managed and, 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 and owned and controlled in its various respects is causing a lot of concern because there are a few very powerful players in, in, in that market who have enormous reach and enormous capability to sort of manage and control. And so, so the, the great problem is the traditional problem that you get a form that has the illusion of participation but is in fact a managed uh, space in various kinds, and that's a real, that's a real, that's a, an ongoing concern. You could say that's always the concern, though. Whenever you've got any sort of deliberative space, it just takes new forms, and this is the form it's now taking. I think that inequality is a thing that is affecting all. Increasing inequality is a thing that's affecting all societies, even my own society, which is. Uh, as I was saying earlier, it's a, a, a society with a long tradition of, uh, of democratic government, with a commitment to sort of welfare, liberalism and social policy, with a sort of pretty open and supportive media environment uh, and relatively neutral and with the capacity for, for individuals to, to have freedom of expression, to express their views openly and, and, and freely. But I think what, one of the things that's really beginning to concern us is this increasing in, uh, economic inequality. And the, 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 the crunch argument is how, how far can inequality 
expand without firstly giving some actors uh, undue and increasing power mm. through their financial resources to implement, influence social, cultural and political events uh, and, and processes. That's really, that's really important. So, so large scale pl players with a, with a strong influence and then, and, and then whether or not the lack of resources really is a constraint on, large, uh, on people being able to sort of realise their political rights and ambitions and to have a voice in political processes. And I think that's, that's a broad concern in many countries, but even in, even, in, even in the UK is an increasing concern. Now, that one, sense, one sense is an interesting thing, which was that the idea that this coincided with digitisation and there was a sort of compensatory activity, you know, compensatory potential mm -hmm. that comes with uh, digitisation that, um, that makes, it, makes the entry point into public engagement, you know, cheaper, easier, mm -hmm. and therefore make, makes it possible for people to, to, to engage. But there, there the devil is in the detail. How many people really are using digital mm -hmm. media in this way? Uh, and then you've got all of the concerns that are quite uh, widely known about uh, uh, filter bubbles. Maybe this isn't an environment which engages people in broader political debates and, and so on. Uh, uh, and uh, literacy, whether people really understand how they can use their, their opportunities through digital me media to sort of have a voice and engage in political deliberation or, uh, or, or, or broader social and cultural affairs. Uh, or whether it's producing a sort of new kind of uh, almost sort of privatised individualism where the, where the person sees the life, as it were, mm -hmm. as themselves and they begin to think of the, their political subjectivity gets structured through the technologies that they have, their, lap, their laptop and their mobile phone are the portal. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's as if it, it, it's, it's coterminous with, you know, tele-shopping in the sense that, we're, that, 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 that our access is through this choice machine and that we begin to think of ourselves that way as not uh, 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 political subjects that are, that are going to be sort of engaged with collectives or broader political questions, but as having certain preferences mm -hmm. that we play out on, online. Mm -hmm. uh, my own feeling is that there's, there's, a, there's a space that might be opened up that's slightly different to that, which is that uh, it is true that you can find out a, a lot very quickly about many things on, mm -hmm. online and that it is an amazing resource if you want to sort of become an active in various uh, in many ways or become more knowledgeable about what's going on or more informed about uh, about uh, what's happening in your your world that that's that's all true and and it and it cre and, and that instead of thinking of this as just a sort of consumer type choice it could be understood in a sense as being a form of uh, political autonomy mm -hmm. that you know in a sense it's a return of the sort of individual as a citizen subject with the power to sort of find out about things and then join in as they see fit and so on so the so the elements of choice and preference are still there but it's a different notion. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a notion of a person looking to know and looking to get engaged in, in, in political uh, or social concerns. So I think that's, that's an idea that's worth exploring. But uh, I think we can't, and it just indicates this notion of technology as neutral in relation to these mm -hmm. processes. It can go either way. It depends, it depends how, how people use the technology. Mm -hmm.